a premium. I would say for it. Oh, I've done a bit of WH baby. I did cross the chair off the side. Yeah. Did you? Okay, good. All the way around on the far wall. Last one. told me just where they sit up here read the But yeah, I've done the email WH baby asking for it. Okay, I've got a cold or a sinus. 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 Well, we, uh, anything we need to take up other than wait for the district attorney general? Yeah, Betsy. 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 Ye
All right, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> we are uh, we don't have any hearing impaired equipment, but we will try to make sure that the microphones are turned up so everybody can hear correctly. If there's any issues with that, let me know, please. All right, then uh, I believe we are ready for the state's next witness. In order to say we call Angela Ezel. Okay. Right here, please. Clerk, right here, be sworn. Can you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony given in this case be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Let us take my chair and speak directly. You may ask. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. If you would state your name for the court, please. Angela Ezel. And if you would spell your first and last name, please. A N G E L A E Z E L L. Thank you. Miss Ezel, uh, where do you live? Uh, Chapel Cemetery Road in Bonacqua. And if you could, for the jury who's not familiar uh, with this area, could you kind of describe where that is in relation to Dixon County? Um, it is exactly a mile from the Dixon County line off the Haven County side. Is that to the south of Dixon County? Yes. Now, I'm going to take us back to May of 2018. Where were you working in May of 2018? R.J. Young in Nashville. And were you working there on May 30th of 2018? I was. Now, when you went to work each day from your residence, uh, how did you get to work? I left my house and went down Sam Vineyard and turned up Tiddle Switch to come to the interstate in Dixon. And so when you got, when you're on Sam Vineyard to Tidwell Switch, did you take a right or a left? I take a right onto Sam Vineyard, a left onto Tidwell Switch. Now, the intersection of Sam Vineyard and Tidwell Switch, is it a four-way intersection? No, there are two paved roads. Sam Vineyard is paved, Tidwell Switch is paved, and then there's a little dirt road that cuts off to the right. All right. Now, once you uh, turn left on this Tidwell Switch, how, I guess, what roads did you take to the interstate? Tidwell Switch, and then I turned onto 46 to interstate at exit 172. And then uh, you took Interstate 40 to, to where? At that time, it was 809 Division Street in downtown Nashville. Thank you. Now, um, did you always take that route? Always. <clears throat> How long had you been working for R.J. Young at that point? Um, Ten years. Did anybody ever ride with you to work? Yes, my niece rode with me to work for two years. Did she on May 30th of 2018? She did ride with me that morning. I stopped at the Coltons and Dixon right before the interstate and picked her up. What time did you typically leave for work? Around 6 a.m. And what time did you typically pick up your niece? Around 6.15. So on the morning of May 30th of 2018, did you take that same route you always took? Yes, sir. Was there anything out of the ordinary that morning? Yes, sir. Um, when I approached the intersection of Sam Vineyard and Tiddle Switch, there was a car parked on the wrong side of the road facing the wrong direction. Now, I should have asked you this a minute ago, but what type of vehicle did you drive at the time? I was in a F-150. Two-door, four-door? Four-door. <clears throat> and what type of car did you see? A sedan, a four-door, probably 90s model car. What color? light tan or a pewter gray tan kind of color. And so when you were coming up Sam Vineyard, you said that it was in the wrong side of the road. If you could, the best of your ability, describe where the car was in relation to how the road is laid out. Okay, so the car was on the left-hand lane, um, just at the mouth of the road, basically. So it was sitting, facing the wrong direction against the flow of traffic at the end of the road, right as Tiddle Switch would turn into Sam Vineyard. Did you notice, notice anything in particular about the car? Um, I noticed that the back windows were fogged up, like it had been sitting there for a while, 
and there were two occupants in the car, a male in the driver's seat and a female in the passenger seat. Were all the windows fogged? Um, I could not see the driver's side as it was up against the opposite side of the road, but definitely the back windows that I could see were fogged. The front passenger window was fogged, but it was also down about three inches so I could see into the car. And so, if you would, just to make sure it's clear, how were you able to see in through a window um, into the car? Because I was in the F-150, it sets up pretty high compared to a sedan. So I had a, as I slowly went around the car, because I didn't know why it was sitting in the middle of the road, I had a straight line of sight down into the car through the lowered passenger window as well as the front windshield. Were you able to see a, a really good picture of who those individuals were? Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, did you end up making any sort of report? I did. Um, I did not feel at the time that it was 911 emergency status because I didn't feel like anyone's life was on the line. Um, and I did not have a number for dispatch. So I waited until I picked my niece up and had her Google the phone number for dispatch. And we called at that time and made a report of the car. Now, which dispatch did you call? Dixon Dispatch. And what did you tell the dispatch? Um, that there was a car sitting on the wrong side of the road and that the occupants appeared to be either passed out or sleeping. Now, these individuals that you saw, did you ever see them again after that day? Not in person, no. What do you mean, not in person? Like, I saw them on the news. <laughs> okay. Those my questions. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Any questions? No questions. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down and you are released. Thank you. Stay my call your next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Kim Wingate. <clears throat> Stand right here, face clerk, raise your right hand, be sworn. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony given in this case be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, Jeff? Yeah. I do. Thank you. I've seen that there. Good afternoon, Ms. Wingate. Could you please say your full name and spell your last name for the court reporter? Kimberly Lynn Wingate, W I N G A T E. And Ms. Wingate, how are you currently employed? I work at the Dixon 911 Communication Center as a day shift supervisor. Okay. And how long have you been in your current position? Um, almost 11 years. And how long have you been working in dispatch total? Well, uh, let me rephrase that. I've been a supervisor for six years and I've been at dispatch for 11. Okay. And as a supervisor, do you have any specific training on the dispatch system? Yes, we are required to do training as far as how to pull recordings, um, CAD dispatch as far as for any calls, things of that nature. There's a lot of training that goes into it. Okay. Could you, um, this is Dixon Dis Dispatch, is that correct that you work for? I think our official name is Dixon County Emergency Communications is what our official. Okay. That's a lot longer. Yeah. Um, could you go ahead and explain to the jury how an E911 um, dispatch system works? As far as like how a 911 call comes in? Yes, please. Okay. So um, depending on landline or a cell phone uh, it's different cases if it comes in from a landline it'll show us information on a screen um, that gives us number um, as far as a cell phone goes anytime it comes in from a cell phone the first information that we see as a dispatcher is the tower address the tower that the cell phone is actually closest to and then if it's with a cell phone, that tower location is what we see, and then occasionally after so many seconds we can see a better location, but it only ever shows us the tower address. The address that we get from the caller is how we know where to go. And when a call comes in, what kind of um, computer recording system starts to starts up? Okay, so anytime a call comes in, um, any call non-emergency or 911 to our center, it is recorded. Um, it immediately, as soon as they dial the number, um, you can sometimes hear on the recordings where it starts recording before we ever actually pick up. You can hear the phone ringing into our center where it starts recording as soon as it picks up that it's a call for our center. Okay. 
And once the call comes in, um, what are the dispatcher's uh, duties at that point? Uh, anytime a call comes in, uh, the first initial is to try to get a location on the call and then to determine what type of call it is. Um, we do that through questioning. Uh, we go through a lot of training uh, when we're first hired on what questions to ask uh, to determine location, type of call, and, and who to send to it. Okay. Is the call when it comes in recorded then and is it preserved? Yes. And while the dispatchers are on the line um, with the caller, are they also making notes in a system uh, to alert other law enforcement? Yes. Um, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so um, even though everything's recorded, we still record everything in what's called a CAD system, which is a computer-aided dispatch system. Um, so all the information that the caller gives us is then logged into that system. Um, such as you know vehicle descriptions on the type of call of uh, people any information that we can get that will assist the responders for the call okay. and is there a system that keeps up with um, the, the CAD corresponding with a call so they're they're logged in different systems so as far as the recordings go they're in a different program as far as um, server base than our CAD system so they're in two separate server locations so you have to log in, the easiest way for me to explain this is you have to log into two separate locations to be able to pull each one. So if I need a call, I have to log into our recording system. If I need the actual just CAD information, just the notes from the call, I have to log into the CAD to get that. Are there numbers that correspond so that you know which calls go with which CAD report? Yes, so uh, when we log into our recording system, um, we are able to see station numbers as far as which station took that call to know which dispatcher took that call to make them match up. And along with taking um, non-emergency and emergency calls, um, do you all keep track of police and emergency services radio traffic as well? Yes, we do for all police, fire, and EMS in Dixon County. And can you um, describe a little bit about how that system works or records? Um, it's it basically it's on the same system as our call system. They're set up through the same recorder system. Um, basically, all radio transmissions are recorded um, as far as incoming and outgoing. Um, it and they're pulled the same way. It's all in the same system. So when we go to pull recordings for the actual radio traffic, it, it, it's, it's listed different, labeled different, but it's all in the same system so we know what's radio traffic and what's a call. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about the radio traffic system, how communications work between dispatch and units? Yeah, so if a unit were, needs to call into what we call central, uh, what they actually have to do is uh, key up the radio, whether it be a mobile, which is what's in their car, or a portable radio, which is like a walkie-talkie. Um, they basically key up on the radio and they have to wait for a beep to be able to talk. Um, if they get a longer, different sounding beep, it's a busy signal. That lets them know that the radio is busy and they're not able to talk because only one person can talk at a time. Um, it goes vice versa, same for dispatch. We have to wait for a beat before we can talk to the responders. Okay, thank you. Uh, Your Honor, if I could approach the witness. So Supervisor Wingate, I've handed you a document. Um, do you recognize what this document is? Yes, I do. It's the CAD report for the incident on May 30th, 2018. Okay. And can you, Talk about a little bit at the top of it what the date was and walk through the beginning top of this document. Uh, so at the very top uh, where it says incident number, is that where you're talking about starting with? Yes. Okay, so that's our the incident number. So every call that comes in is assigned an incident number. Um, it's always the year, month, day, and then it's assigned a three-digit number that's particular to that day. And then it um, to the right of that, it talks about incident type, non-emergency. So that means um, that's where we classify if it come in non-emergency line, 911 line, or if it was an officer-initiated call. Um, and this call came in as a non-emergency? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then could you go down to talk about the receive? Right. So it says received at, and it gives the date, which was 5-30-2018 at 6-19 and 37 seconds. And what is the dispatched at? Uh, that's the time that our dispatcher gave the call out to responders and assigned somebody the first unit to that call. Okay. And then scrolling down a little bit where it says an event type? 
Yep, this is how we classify calls. So um, this one was classified as a welfare check. Okay. Um, and then the caller locations? So the caller location is, is blank on this. So uh, underneath that, it's the event location. So that's the actual location that we were given of the incident. Okay. And would that have been done by the caller who called Right. Them? Okay. Um, and then there's a caller name that's been listed? Mm -hmm. And um, so we are, we always ask for the name of the callers when they call in. They don't have to give it to us, but when they do, we do document it. Okay. Um, and then the comment, could you talk about what the comment means? Okay, so the comment is always just a brief description of what's going on with the call. So in this incident, it says a small 1090s model vehicle parked on the wrong side of the roadway. So it's just a basic, generic, this is what's what the caller said, and then we go into further on down into the call, usually if there's more information to be on. Okay, um, and on the first line of the narrative log, can mm -hmm. you explain what the different columns mean? Uh, the first where it says narrative by, that's the dispatcher who entered the information. The narrative at uh, shows the date and time that it was entered. Um, the category can be used, but in this case was not. It's just basically if it's for certain responders, so uh, where we can change the category, we're for police, fire, EMS. In this instance, it was not used. Okay. Um, there's an is sensitive co column. Uh, this is where we can mark to where it says yes or no. Um, I've honestly never seen where we marked it yes. So okay. other than that, that's all I can tell you about that. Okay. So, but this is the CAD, the full CAD report for Dixon dispatch um, for the incident uh, at Tidwell Switch and San Bernard Road called in by Miss Angela. Is that correct? That is correct. Your Honor, the state would move this as the state's next exhibit. However, we would like to have this witness keep it um, while she testifies. Right, is that 10? Is it 10? Let's get it marked. Okay. Now, Ms. Wingate. Um, there was a 911 call that was associated with this. Are you familiar with the citizen 911 call? I am familiar. Call two on Wednesday, May 30th, 2018, at 6.19 a.m. with a GMT offset of 300 minutes. Agent ID is extension is 603. Excuse me, Chair. Stephanie, how may I help you? Hi, Stephanie. I'm calling because there is a uh, car parked on the wrong side of the road with what appears to be two people either asleep or passed out in it. Okay, where is it at? It's at the end of Tidal Switch and Sam Vineyard. Two little switch in the same venue, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay, and what kind of vehicle is it? Um, a little Toyota, I think. Perhaps a Honda, but small, kind of probably 90s model car. Kind of.
306. Is that segment number 20 from this dispatch log? Or sorry, from the dispatch call in? Yes, I believe so. Okay. And how can you explain how the segments are, are broken up? Why this is number 20? Or? Um, so I'm not exactly sure how the system divides it into segments other than per radio transmission. Um, so generally it'll divide them as far as a receiving transmit and one going out. Uh, so for example, the easiest way I can explain that is if um, say car 14 called into Dixon Central and I answered and then he gave me his radio traffic, usually that's divided into one segment, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, completion of the radio traffic from this call. Right. Would be exhibit 12. <coughs> now, Supervisor Wingate, um, when you heard that radio traffic uh, about one in custody um, and they're going to dispatch, what does that mean to you all? Um, that they have um, someone, they've arrested somebody and that they're en route to dispatch because generally if someone has uh, warrants or anything, they have to come by dispatch to pick up those warrants before they transport them to the jail okay. and is that something in the normal course of police business that police officers have to do yes we hear it multiple times every day yeah. so that is a police function that they call in and then they let somebody know where they where they are and what's going on yes um, and in that call did you recognize was that car 500s was that the original person assigned to car 500s voice at first I did not um, but <coughs> as radio traffic progressed, I didn't realize it was not him. It was not Sergeant Baker. That's great. Okay. Nothing further, Your Honor. No Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. You are released and you may be on your way. Stay in my car your next witness. I Deputy Lashley, if you'll come forward, please. State your full name for the record, please. Christopher Stanley Lashley. Can we spell your first and last name? No, it's C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R-L-A-S-H-L-E-E. -E. Thank you. And Deputy Lashley, are you employed by the Dixon County Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. And how long have you been employed there? Since 2010. Thank you. And what's your current position? Corporal. Corporal. And Corporal Lashley, were you? <clears throat> what was your position 
in May of 2018. FTO. And which shift were you working? Third shift, sir. And what is a third shift? Third shift was, I got off seven o'clock every morning, depending on. Okay. So essentially third shift, you were working over the nighttime hours? Yes, sir. Into the early morning. About what time would you go on duty? I'd go on nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, somewhere there. And then get off at what time? Seven. Seven. A.M., sir. Okay. So let me take you back to May 30th of 2018. Do you, do you remember that day? Yes, sir. And were you working that day? Yes, sir. And can you tell us uh, briefly just kind of where you were at about uh, 6.20 to 6.30 a.m.? I was on Jones Creek Road. Okay. And what were you doing? I was just patrolling. And did you hear a call or dispatch over the radio about a suspicious vehicle? Yes, sir. And, and, and what did you do then? Uh, I called in route to the call and headed that way. And <clears throat> what, why did you go in route to that call? The dispatch called it out. It was suspicious call, suspicious vehicle parked at the intersection. Okay. And when you called in route, uh, just generally, where was your uh, Jones Creek location compared to where you would end up at Tidwell Switch and Sam Vineyard? About how far? Guesstimating 15 miles. Okay. Uh, so when you went en route to uh, dispatch call, did you hear anything over the radio that concerned you? Yes, sir. And what did you hear? Was that... I, I actually heard the, you know, them state that the vehicle was stolen. Okay. You heard uh, dispatch? Dispatch did. Corporal, if you'll pull that microphone a little bit closer to you, then it might help us to make sure we pick it up. Thank you. Yes, sir, sir. And then after that, uh, heard an altercation over the radio. Then I heard something. It, it, I heard gunshots over the radio. You heard gunshots over the radio? Yes, sir. And, <clears throat> and Corporal, I, I know this is tough. Uh, I'm trying to walk through it, just kind of step by step. So, let me back up just a little bit. You heard the dispatch say that a vehicle was stolen. Yes, sir. If you were on scene and you ran a license plate number, would is that what you would do to confirm whether a vehicle had been reported stolen? Yes, sir. Like, like how would you do it? Would you key up on your radio? Yes, sir. And what would you ask dispatch? I, I would first run the tag, and then dispatch would come back to me and inform me that it's been you know, reported stolen. Did that where, tag number? Yes, okay. and where it was stolen from. Okay, and, and you say on the morning of May 30th, you heard dispatch over the radio confirm that it was stolen? Yes, sir. Now, at some point after that, I believe you've testified you heard what you thought was an altercation? Yes, sir. And also some gunfire? Yes, sir. And what, what did you do then? I, <laughs> I sped up as fast as I could try. Okay. Uh, we, we've heard some brief testimony about priority one and priority two. Uh, were you priority one after you heard the gunshots? Yes, sir. And does that mean lights and sirens? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and what location were you en route to? I was en route to the intersection of Tidwell Switch and Sam Vineyard. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. Deputy, in just a second, Deputy Lashley, if you walk over in front of the map, I want to speak up so that the report board can hear us. Yes, sir. Uh, can you identify the roads here on this map? Yes, sir. The intersection is Sand Vineyard Road and Tibble Switch Road. Okay, so can you point to Tibble Switch and Sand Vineyard? Tibble Switch right here, this is Sand Vineyard right here. And you were en route to this location? Yes, sir. And this location is in Dixon County, Tennessee? Yes, sir. And tell us, and now you can kind of turn and face the jury if you'd like. Uh, 
uh, <coughs> which area did you enter the location from, or which road? I come down the Chisel Switch right here, and ended right here at the stop sign. All right. And when you got to the stop sign at Tidwell Switch, what did you observe? <coughs> I observed coming down the hill. I observed there was a brown Saturn vehicle parked right here. It was actually in the left lane. So I the left lane, would that be the oncoming lane of traffic? Yes, sir. So you observed a brown Saturn? Yes, sir. You, what else did you observe? I observed, as, as I was coming down, I observed car 500. Saturn that you just described. Let's, um, Mr. Crouch, if you don't mind, let's turn that display so that the jury can still see it, but they can also see the witness, please. As long as he's not being blocked by it so that the witnesses can observe it. Somehow we've... <laughs> so, Deputy Lashley, when you arrived at this intersection, you've already testified, you observed a Saturn, and then you observed Unit 500 uh, turn and go by you? Is that yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, who did you... What, what did you think was going on? I was coming down, when I was coming down the hill, everything had already calmed down. I was observing the scene. I thought car 500 was going to pull in behind me. It kept going. And of course, when I refer to car 500, who would you think would be in car 500? Sergeant Baker. Sergeant Baker. And you worked with Sergeant Baker. Didn't yes. Uh, so car 500 actually passes you or turns by you? Yes. And you're at the scene with this Saturn. What, what do you do? I got on the radio and I asked him what he wanted me to do with the car. And I'm going to play for you, uh, Deputy, what has previously been marked as Exhibit 12, which is Call 20. And I'll Call ask you to listen to the voices. Baker. A30 of 2018, set 60 a.m. to the GMT offset of negative 300 minutes. Agent ID is extension is 115. Daniel, you good? Deputy, were you able to hear that? No. Okay, uh, let's play it again. <coughs> yep. And again, I'm referring to Exhibit 12. Well, I mean, I ain't tied here. <coughs> Go back over again. Call 20 on Wednesday, May 30th, 2018 at 6.50 a.m. with a GMT offset of negative 300 minutes. Agent ID is extension is 115. Daniel, you good? Time Deputy. Uh. Well, I mean, I ain't tied here. Okay, pause. And Deputy, do you recognize your voice there? Yes, sir. And what, what do you key up and say initially? When I asked him if he was good. You say, did you say, Daniel, you good? Yes, sir. And did you hear a response? I did. And, and what was the response? I 
couldn't make out what it said. It's, okay. Uh, and, and then did you ask a question? What does he want me to do with the car? And I'll play it one more time for you. <clears throat> Call 20 on Wednesday, May 30th, 2018 at 6.50 a.m. with a GMT offset of negative 300 minutes. Agent ID ex extension is 115. Daniel, you good? Oh. Here. That's good. Does that refre refresh your recollection? Yes, sir. And what were you asking Sergeant Baker? I was asking him if he was good, okay. if everything was okay. And, and, and the, what else? The response that I received was, I've got one in custody. Okay. And then I asked if he wanted me to hang tight here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> did you recognize the voice that said one in custody? I haven't worked with Daniel Hardly on his shift. I, I didn't know if he was worked up or sure. I couldn't recognize his voice. Okay. And so when, when you hear this radio transmission and you're at the scene, what, what do you do next? I walked around the scene, just something didn't feel right. And I observed the scene, I went to the car and checked it. I walked up to the car and looked at it. I opened the door. I found a magazine, loaded magazine, and a digital scale sitting in the seat. I set it on the roof. I closed the door. I walked around the vehicle. Around the back of the vehicle was one of our key cards laying on the ground. And I walked around to the other side of the car, opened the door to find a registration. Couldn't find it. So I walked back around. At that time, the other deputies you know, showed up on scene and found a button and then that's when I found the blood and every, well right before I found the blood I called Daniel's phone and uh, because I was concerned with the shell casings I found and everything and I asked him about that and the, the call was in and out the service was bad and I know I kept asking him if he could hear me or what have you but we ended up losing the call, and then right after that, I found the blood and the sunglasses, and I took a picture of it, and I sent it to his phone and asked him if that was this guy's blood. Okay. Let me, let me back up and, and talk. You've kind of told us a lot. Um, you pass Unit 500, and you don't exactly know what's going on. Is that right. Correct? But you, you get out of your vehicle, and what unit are you? I was in 548 at the time, I think. And you start looking around the scene where the Saturn is parked? Yes, sir. And what do you observe initially? Initially, with shell cases laying on the, the road, on the pavement, right beside the driver's door. Okay. And, and when you saw a shell casing, what did you think? It, I, I, remember, I just reverted back to hearing the gunshots. And... Uh, so then I started looking. All right, you saw shell casings. What else did you see on the ground? On the ground was a Daniel's key card. And when you say a key card, can you describe that for us? It, a white card, like a credit card almost, but it's solid white. But it's, we unlocked the doors at the sheriff's office with it. And you saw that on the ground? Yes, sir. What else did you see? A button from his, his shirt. Could it be a button similar to a button off of your uniform? Exactly like that. And you saw one of the buttons on the ground? Yes, sir. Okay. What else did you see? And then I seen the blood with Daniel's. Sunglasses. You saw that on the scene? You saw a pool of blood? Yes. And, and, and Sergeant Baker's sunglasses? Now, you testified that you uh, saw a magazine. What, what is a magazine? Magazine. It was fully loaded, and it was in the driver's seat of the vehicle. Okay. 
And, and did you remove that magazine from the vehicle? I, I set it on the roof. And I think you testified there was another item next to or, or in the vehicle that you also removed? A, a digital scale. And I believe that you took a photograph of this. <coughs> Is that correct? Or someone in the Sheriff's a, Department took a photograph? Not of the digital scale. Okay. The magazine. Now let me, let me uh, ask you if you can identify this photograph. Yes, sir. All right, can, can you describe what, what that is? It's the digital scale and the, the loaded magazine I set on top of the vehicle. Okay. You set them on top of the Saturn? Yes, sir. What, what made you take it out of the vehicle and set it on the roof? I was just trying to put two and two together. Uh, you find a loaded magazine, nobody around, no gun, empty shell casings. I just put evidence on the roof. Sure. I didn't want anybody to put, miss it or pass it up. And I don't—I certainly don't want to put words in your mouth, but were you still kind of confused as to what had happened? Yes, sir. Uh, what was your thought process when you observed all these items on the ground? I was in a whirlwind. Uh, I was hoping somebody else. Okay. Your Honor, if I could move that photograph as exhibit, I believe it's 13. I mean, 13. If you would hand that to the clerk, please. <clears throat> Now, uh, Deputy or Corporal Lashley, you, you said that you attempted to get in contact with Sergeant Baker by your cell phone, is that correct? Yes, sir. Did you physically dial his number? Yes, sir, I did. And did someone answer? Yes. Uh, did you recognize the voice that answered? I did not. I did not, but the reception was horrible sure. down there. I understand. Uh, when 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 that call dropped, did you also send a text message? Yes, sir, I did. Did you take a photograph with your phone? I did. And send that to Sergeant Baker? Yes, sir. De Corporal, if you could please identify this photograph, please. <coughs> It's a black and white copy of the picture I took. Okay. And, and is, you took a picture with your cell phone, is that correct? Yes, sir. And what does that picture di show? That picture shows a, a large puddle of blood with a pair of black Costa sunglasses missing the lens laying beside it. And, and Corporal, if you would look at the screen, is, is the photograph you're holding uh, exactly the same as the photograph displayed on the screen. And I'm going to step over here. Corporal, I know this is difficult, but we were having to record. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So just make a verbal response. I'm sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Corporal Lashley, at the top of this photograph, can you tell us the name and phone number? Yes, sir. It's Daniel Baker. The phone number, I think the glass is 80. Okay, we'll skip the phone number. Can you read? Yes, sir. Text message, Saturday, May 26, uh, Will Domino's delivery to your house? Yes, sir. So, uh, obviously, you've got some old addresses you can I do, I do. I, he was my neighbor. Yes, sir. And, and you live close to Sergeant Baker? Yes, sir. And that's why you asked about Domino's? Yes, sir. Now let me take your attention to Wednesday, May the 30th, 2018. Uh, what is your text message? That text message, it says, is that your guy's blood all over the road? And, and did you ever receive a response? I never did. Move that as the next exhibit, please. Exhibit 14. And at this point, Ron, I'm going to move the large map as exhibit 15. All right. The map will be marked as exhibit 15. Corporal Lashley, uh, and again, we're, we're almost finished. <clears throat> How long did you stay at the, what I'm calling the Sam Vineyard Tidwell Switch crime scene? I was there till 6.30 that night. What were some of your other duties at this scene throughout that day? Just to secure the scene. Secure the scene. I'll pass the witness. No question. 
Thank you, Corporal. You may step down and you were released from your subpoena. So. Thank you. General Sagan, you may call your next witness. General of State calls Keith Dearborn. General uh, Krauss, is there a reason to leave the Exhibit 15 up, or can we take it down? No, we can take it up. The tripod needs to stay up. Oh, that's fine. You want to stand right here, take the square right up front of this one? Keep something square from the testimony you give in this case. Be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you go. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I want to make sure that I get your rank correct. Um, Sergeant Dearborn? Yes, ma'am. Right. Sergeant Dearborn, could you please state your full name for the record and spell your last name? It's uh, Sergeant Gregory Keith Dearborn, and the spelling is D-E-A-R-B-O-R-N. And Sergeant Dearborn, how are you currently employed? As a school resource officer. How long have you been in law enforcement? I'm working on my 22nd year. Okay. And could you just give us a brief overview of what your law enforcement career has been? I uh, started off working in the jail, um, worked there for about eight months, was promoted to patrol. Um, shortly after, I was on the special operations team for about 12 and a half years, um, worked patrol for 20 years, and in the last two years, I've been a school resource officer. Okay. Um, in, in May of 2018, what shift were you assigned to? First shift. And what is first shift's hours? Uh, at the time, it was seven. Uh, it was working 10 hours. Um, it was 7 to 4.45. Okay. And who was your shift sergeant at the time? Daniel Baker. And do you remember the morning of May the 30th, 2018? Yes, ma'am. Could you please share um, with the court and the jury um, what you did that morning uh, when you got up, when you came into work, and some observations? So we'll just start with how your day started going on shift. Okay. I, I usually left the house about... 625, 620. Um, during the summertime, we'd always meet out back behind the sheriff's office at a picnic table for shift meeting. And, uh, and I'll, I'll stop you right now and ask, okay. what's a shift meeting? Uh, pretty much the, the shift gets together, goes over, you know, what where the sergeants would need us and what, and what zones we would work. And, you know, it, pretty much where, the, where what we needed, the work of the day needed to be done. You know, like if they needed traffic detail work in a certain part of the area we I pay more attention to that area or stuff like that you know would you also get like information passovers um, yes ma'am important things that you would need to know going yes ma'am okay um, so you after you rolled to the Dixon County Sheriff's Office to the picnic tables for roll call um, while you were at roll call uh, did you hear something that uh, was different actually on the way it, it sounded like when I heard they just passed a call for suspicious vehicle at Tibble Switch. And that morning, um, Daniel had checked in route to it, and I thought, because he lived down the south part of the county, I thought, to help the other shifts out, we would kind of like step up, try to help up, you know, go into calls early so they could go home on time, because they'd worked all night. So he, and Daniel was good about help, trying to help the other guys out so they could go home. And he was headed down there to this suspicious call. Well, in between, by the time I got to the sheriff's office, and got out of my car to walk up to the back of the sheriff's office where we was all meeting. Um, sounded like something garbled all over the radio, like a like a struggle. Um, then dispatch tried to raise it, and they couldn't, so I started getting worried. Um, then Deputy Richley come up, and, so I, and I wanted I wanted to check in route. Well, um, Corporal Lashley checked in route, and Joe Loveless they checked in route, so they was already further south than we were. When we left, we run, was running priority one traffic. So we didn't know, we knew something was going, we didn't know what it was. Um, but generally the rules are, if there's other units closer, the furthest ones will back down 
and then the closest ones will stay running blue, you know, blue lights and sirens priority. Uh, on the radio, I heard one in custody. Um, but what was strange was it didn't sound like Daniel. Um, I couldn't tell you who it was, but I knew it wasn't him. And, and I've heard Daniel's voice a million times and, you know, working with him, working for him. Um, and it confused me. I, I, I didn't know what was going on. You know, it's like, I heard that, but it just didn't, pro I couldn't process it. And uh, I was talking to Deputy Richley on the phone. I said, it was it just me or does that not sound like him? Because we still on our way down there. I was on the phone with him. I said, something, what was it? Is it my radio? Is it me? Am I just not? He said, no, that wasn't him. He said, I didn't sound like him. And so I was more confused. The further I got, I just trying to figure out why, what, it just wasn't making sense. And I couldn't, yeah. Now, Deputy, sorry, Sergeant Durborn, I'm going to ask you about, about the, when you hear the, the 10 one in custody, what does that mean to you as an officer? Well, it means, it, and it could be, it's, it's could be, I mean, it means that they've taken custody of, of a, a suspect or a prisoner. Um, that particular situation, if you hear somebody struggling and you hear 10 one in custody, you're like, okay, well, they got them, they, it, this ain't secure. So, and that's why me and him back, we was the furthest ones out, so we backed down because we thought everything was okay, but everything was fine. And the language that was being used, was that language that you are used to as a law enforcement yeah. officer that you do in your everyday job? Yeah, and it, it was confusing because the language was there, but it, well, it didn't sound like him. That's what was confusing. Um, did you make it, after you heard that, you said that you and Deputy Richlick were on your way. Where were you on the way to? To table switch, to where he, to where he had checked out with the vehicle. Um, and could you describe when you got onto the scene what you first saw? When we first got there, uh, I seen Corporal Lashley <laughs> and, and Joe Lovis was already there. They were, we were pulled on the side of the road and me and Deputy Richley pulled up and, and they was like, what do we got? And they said, we don't know. We, and, we walked down the hill and we seen a, a gray silver Saturn sitting at the intersection and looking around we seen a pool of blood Do you remember seeing anything else on the ground? I seen the buttons. The sunglasses. When you saw those, what was your first thought? I didn't know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I didn't know. You know, it, it wasn't good. I knew that. Um, and, and the blood. You know, it's. I've been a cop for a long time. And when I seen the color of that blood, it was, I knew it was bad. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, anyway, just. Do you remember who the officers were that were down there on the scene with you? Yes, ma'am, it was uh, Deputy Steve Richlick, uh, Deputy Joe Loveless, uh, and Deputy and Corporal Chris Lashley. Did do your to the best of your recollection? Okay. Do you remember um, what they what they started to do, or if anybody left at that point? We had we had little or no cell phone service or radio service. Um, at best, I mean, it was hit and miss. We were. Chris had told me, Deputy Lashley had told me that he seen. Maybe he thought Daniel's truck passing when he come in. Um, which 
made no sense because if 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 the scene's going, you don't leave the scene. If if you got an active scene going on, you wait till you get other officers there to process the scene. You just whether it be a suspicious vehicle, a stolen vehicle, it doesn't. You don't just up and leave a crime scene. And that I couldn't figure that out. And it, we got down there, and we like I said, I seen we seen the pool of blood. His key card, his glasses, his busted sunglasses, the button off of his shirt, blue button laying there. Uh, and so I told I told the guys, I said, look, I, I don't know what we've got. I said, we need to rope this off. I said, I, I, don't, I don't know. I said, better rope it off and, and play safe. We can process it, uh, call our you know, CID and let them look at it. Um, and then they were, I believe they were trying to ping Daniel's GPS in his truck. They were trying to find out where in fact the truck had gone to. Um, Steve went to look for the truck. Joe, he, he, they said he was running route to dispatch. Joe left, he said, I'm gonna go to dispatch and see if I can locate Daniel. Um, then I think they pinged it at another location. Steve said, another location, I'm gonna go to that. So me and Chris were still on the scene. Lash, Corporal Lashley, and I told him, I said, we need to rope this off. Let's get, let's get roping it off. So he started roping it off, and we, I started taking pictures and just trying to secure, preserve the crime scene. I mean, like I said, we didn't know what we had. We didn't know what happened. Do you remember seeing any shell casings or ammunition? Yes, ma'am, I do. Do you yes, remember where that was approximately? It was around the car, around the silver uh, of the gray silver Saturn. And do you know if they were, if it was live rounds or shell cases? It was empty shell cases, is what I've seen. Now, you just mentioned that you and uh, Corporal Lashley were there on the scene, that you were trying to rope it off and preserve it. Um, how long were you at that scene? Uh, from that morning. It was early that morning until late in the evening when they transported Daniel to Nashville. Um, it, it was all day. I mean, I don't have the time because every time run together, but it was late in the evening. Um, it was hot. I mean, it was way hot. Um, and it was, I was there all day until the evening started getting dark when we I left. Did your duties change while you were there from um, one position of securing a scene to another type of responsibility? Yes, ma'am. When we set up the crime scene, uh, the tape, uh, I took pictures to start the crime scene log. Um, when the TBI got there, I turned it over to them I, and I started doing what's called overwatch as security for them while they're processing the scene because at the time we didn't know you know, we did, I didn't know what was going on. And so while they're doing their job, I was performing overwatch duties. In other words, just watch scanning, watching, make sure if, they, if there's still threats out there, I can handle that while they're trying to do their job. Okay. Um, so the overwatch, were you essentially security for the TBI yes, while they were doing? Yes, ma'am. And were you armed at the time? Yes, ma'am. I was armed with a, with a M16. And do you know approximately how long, was it, were you down there on overwatch for hours? Yeah, yes ma'am, it was, yeah. Um, from that morning, well, from that morning till I guess it was almost right before the lunch, the TPI had come down there and it was right about around lunchtime, that's when I started doing overwatch at noonish, give or take. Um, then they, like I said, they were processing the scene and that's when I went from handling the crime scene to just being security for them. And why did they, why did you believe they needed security? I'm sorry? Why did you believe they needed security? Because whoever had done this, we didn't know who did it or what happened or we knew, we knew at that point in time, I guess it's about lunchtime that I, I think that's in that time frame when they found Daniel and we didn't know who did it, what happened. I didn't because I had no radio service. I didn't have any cell phone service. And so and I erred on the side of caution. I thought, well, I don't want it to happen again. Did you feel that there might still be a threat? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was, I was scared. I didn't know. If, I didn't want to be the next one. So. Nothing further. Questions? No what? Thank you, sir. You may sit down. They may call your next witness. Speaking with Steve Richwick.
would stand right here and ask Claire Briggs right hand be sworn. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give in this case be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you? Yes, ma'am. Just have a seat right there. Speak directly. You state your full name for the court, please. Stephen Charles Richlick. And will you spell your last name? R Y C H L I K. Thank you. And uh, Deputy, where are you employed? Dixon County Sheriff's Office. And what's your position there? Patrol. And how long have you been employed with Dixon County? August 18th of 2000. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> what shift were you working on May the 30th of 2018? First shift. And when does first shift come on duty? Come in at 645. 645. And we work till 445. 6.45 a.m. till 4.45 p.m.? Yeah, that's what time we're going to be at roll call, 6.45. So you get there earlier. Okay. And on the morning of May 30th, 2018, uh, did you attend roll call? I was just, just, I was pulling up. I think I was getting out of my car. Getting out of your car? Getting out of my car at the it, back of the sheriff's office. Where does, and I was going to ask that, where does roll call happen? Um, at the sheriff's office, we pull around back and we go into the training room. And we all just kind of congregate there out back just where everybody's going to be that day and what's going on. So a roll call would be for your shift? Yes, sir. And the sheriff's office is in what city is that in? Dixon, or Charlotte. And we're in Charlotte right now? Yes, sir. All right. Is Charlotte north of the city of Dixon? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, when you got to roll call that morning, did you hear uh, a transmission on the radio that concerned you? I did. What, what did you hear? I heard Daniel Baker in distress. You did? I did. And what did you do? <clears throat> we just uh, head out towards uh, where he was at. And, and, and Sergeant Baker was your ship, ship he was, supervisor? He was my supervisor. Uh, and what was it uh, kind of normal for Sergeant Baker to respond to a call bef before shift? Oh, yes, sir. People on their way to work, you know, if it's close to where you are, just help somebody out, help whip the shifts out. Even if well, you're going home in the evening, just kind of help out take some burden off somebody else but it was you know it was never off for to go help somebody you know another shift out or somebody else out on a call and this particular call was near the south end of the county yes sir and and sergeant baker lived on the south end of the county kind of pretty much yes sir all right uh you hear this distress call what what did you do head that way priority one or two one one and, and why were you priority one and just the sound of Baker and kind of broke up transmission and he was in distress. It's not something you knew usually heard. It's not something that was normal. Uh, as you were going south uh, to this location, did you hear some additional radio transmissions? Did. What did you hear? One in custody. Everything's 10-4, one in custody, being en route to dispatch. So you heard one in custody, and then you heard, uh, what was the second one? It's like being route to dispatch. Being route to dispatch. Which is where we take people after we on an arrest to meet with a magistrate or judge. Was, was it Sergeant Baker's voice that you heard? It didn't sound like it to me. Okay. Uh, what, what, what did you think when you heard this transmission on the radio? The one in custody and en route to central dispatch. It was off. Fair enough. Wasn't normal. Wasn't normal. Uh, did you keep heading south? Yes, sir. And did you arrive at the Tidwell Switch Sam Benyard uh, intersection? Yes, sir. And what did you do when you arrived there? I was the third car and uh, got out, walked to the corner, and just kind of walking through the scene. Just what's all what's all going on met up with Lashley and kind of we started walking around did you know where Sergeant Baker was did not uh, w were you all trying to find him yeah well when I first got there kind of assessing the scene and then it became where's he at we didn't have cell service good and it was hard to get out on the radio all right uh, what, what did you observe uh, at the scene <clears throat> walking down Sam Vineyard. Where was it, Bud?
and a pro pair of sunglasses. Thank you. <clears throat> Need a second? I'm good. Uh, and then we found, we found the blood down there, too. You saw some blood? Yes, sir. Now, Deputy Richlick, you didn't stay at the uh, Tidwell Switch Vineyard intersection? No, sir. Uh, where did you go? Um, we got a... When we got a hold of his GPS location, um, they said he was on Bear Creek Valley. And I've worked to call him Bear Creek Valley before, so I knew where it was. And I was like, you know, there's no reason he should be over there. And, and let me stop for just a second. When you say you got his GPS location, uh, each of you have a patrol unit. And Sergeant Baker's was 500, is that correct? Yes, sir. It, do you remember the unit you were in on that day? It might have been 505. Okay. Or f I don't know if I had still had my car from second shift. Yeah. I don't know if I had swapped cars yet. I can't remember right now. Are each of the units equipped with a GPS, GPS. device? Where, yes, sir. Where dispatch and the sheriff's office can see where each unit is? Yes, sir. Is that what you meant when you said you got coordinates? Yes, sir. All right. So you received information about uh, Bear Creek Valley Road? Yes, sir. And then did you head that direction? I did. All right. And when you got on Bear Creek Valley Road, is that inside Dixon County? Yes, sir. What, what did you observe? Have you ever driven down shirt roads, like that, like the dirty brown roads? You know when somebody's driven in front of you, it turns up and it's darker. And I saw one set of tracks. It would go from broken asphalt, shirt, broken asphalt, shirt. And so I knew there was a car down there within just not long because it was still dark color where the tracks were. And I followed the tracks till, and uh, there was a, a like a sharp left turn. You can see where it turned over a little more. And there was barbed wire strands just kind of hanging. And uh, the grass was high in a field and I saw tracks going through the grass, through the field, I'll say. And Deputy, I'm going to ask you if you can identify this photograph, please. Yes, sir. And what is that photograph? That's the Chirp Road, how it actually still looks. And to the left, the fence where um, the barbed wire was down. Right. And does the photograph you're holding match what we see on the screen? Yes, sir. And is this Bear Creek Valley Road? Yes, sir. All right. Now this road also has, uh, it, depending on which map you pull up, it can have a, another name too, is that correct? It does. All right. uh, so is this the church you're talking about? Yes, sir. I'll move this photograph as the next exhibit, please. 16. Deputy Richler, can you identify this photograph? Yes, sir. And what is that? That's where, that's the barbed wire fence in the field. Okay. I'll move that as uh, exhibit 16. 17. 17. And Deputy Richard, one last photograph. Can you identify that? That's where I went through the fence. And we see a red line. Yes. You placed that red line there. I did, actually, yeah. In fact, you took this photograph. I did. Thank you. And... Why did you put the red line on the photo? That's where the fence was down. Okay. So you saw tracks on the church road and the fence down right there? I did. The grass was through the field is about as high as it is in front of that fence. Okay. So that's why I was able to see where the car went through in the tracks in the, in the grass. I'll move that as the next exhibit, please. 18. <clears throat> Did you, what, what did you do when you saw the tracks through the field? Drove right through it. All right. And how far out into the field did you drive? Before that tree over the first post, mm -hmm. I was probably, I wasn't far from that tree one. Okay. To the left when I stopped my car there. If, if you were in your patrol car and you were on the road, were you able to see uh, unit 500 anywhere here? No, sir. You could not see his vehicle? No, sir. You could see tracks? I could see tracks. 
And it was still morning, so the ground was a little wet and stuff like that, so. Okay. All right, Deputy, I'm going to ask you to stand up in just a moment and identify this map if you can. That's the same. Now, we've already discussed that, it, that depending on which map you use, it's Bear Creek Valley Road, or, or what is this also? Road. Like? And, and Myatt Cemetery Road? Yes. So but it's marked on the sign when you first turn into it, it's Bear Creek Valley from um, to the switch. Okay. And just to avoid any confusion, when we say Bird Road or Bear Creek Valley Road, it's the same road. Same road. And can you identify on this map where you entered the field? We've already seen the smaller photos. Right okay. here. In which direction were you traveling? It's coming this way. Is that generally a north to south direction or east to west, or do you know? Probably east is I'm thinking. Okay. And, and you drove through the barbed wire or the down the barbed wire fence? Yes, sir. And will you show us where, approximately where you parked your patrol car? And put it on the close to this tree line for cover. When you got on that tree line, could you see uh, Deputy no. Baker or his vehicle? Could not. What did you do then? Um, I used it on my patrol car and I walked this tree line to about, about right here. When they saw his car. You saw his car? Yes, sir. Did you approach the vehicle? Yes, sir. And what did you see? You need not see His car, um, windows up, doors locked. Um, I looked in the window. Could you see into the windows? I can see in the front window, the front seat. Um, then I, I looked, looking into the back of a tinted car, kind of where you have a little overcast it's like trying to look through that wall it's it's dark so i couldn't see in the back seat check the doors i did unlocked or locked 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 uh, did you notice anything else about the vehicle that's fine mm, yeah nothing offhand uh, nothing offhand mm -hmm. what did you do after you checked the doors just walked around the car were you alone at this point um at, at what time we found the car um, Deputy Cave, um, he he was pulling up. Um, we were both going down. I think he was on he was on the opposite side. Um, as we as I saw the car, as I was at the car, Cave was coming up to the car also. Okay. Did you know where Sergeant Baker was? No. What did you do then? Walked around the car. Check of course. Check the doors. Um, we were yelling for him um, and just kind of seeing if he was in, you know, if we could yell for him, walking around the car. Um, did you leave the area where his car did. was? Where did you go? On the other side, opposite side of the car, right on the fence line, there was a small patch of dirt and it had a footprint just right on top of it, like he was going over the fence, somebody went over the fence. So we hopped the fence. Um, we both went uh, across the field to the creek. I went left through the creek. We were just yelling for him, walked up the creek. Um, and then I cut back across the field. I was going over a high point that was to the left across the way. Thank you. And we're almost finished, but I would like for you to approach the map again. And with a yellow sticker, place a marker where you believe the location of Sergeant Baker's vehicle was. And that's, sorry, his, his vehicle was Unit 500. 500. And after you checked the vehicle, you said you crossed the fence. Can you point out which fence you crossed? Like just to the other side, car space on this way. Okay. And just right here at the fence. And then we went across the creek, or to the creek, 
I went this way. Thank you. Come across here. Now, how long did you stay down on the creek? I honestly can't tell you how long. What What prompted you to go back to vehicle 500? <clears throat> I heard uh, Nathaniel Proctor yelling. Um, and you get don't him. have to say what he said. Yeah. The yelling, yelling, is that what made you go I, that's what That's what had me turn around, yeah. Okay. I'll move the large map as the next exhibit, please. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll pass the witness, but we will use the map for the next witness as well. Any questions this witness? No, you're wrong. Thank you. I'll show you my stuff now. Do you solemnly swear from testimony you give in this case be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you guys? I do. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Would you state your full name for the court, please? Brian Cave. And spell your last name? C A V E. Thank you. And where are you employed? Dixon County Sheriff's Office. What's your position there? I'm a sergeant on third shift. Sergeant Cave, were you employed with Dixon County Sheriff's Office May 30th of 2018? I was. Uh, do you remember where you were at approximately 6.30 to 7 a.m. on that morning? I was on my front porch drinking coffee, getting ready to go to SWAT training. On your front porch drinking coffee. And where were you about to go? SWAT training. SWAT training. And did you go to SWAT training? No, I did not. And why not? I responded to an officer down call. Uh, how did you hear a call for an officer being down? I was in my patrol unit, actually headed to, uh, to the range uh, over by Buckner Park, and there was chaos over the radio. Um, they were, couldn't get any response from Sergeant Baker, and um, I was the next closest unit, at, and I turned around at Livestock Yard there by Pilot and went to aid uh, Deputy Richlick. Okay. Do you remember the location uh, that you went to aid Deputy Richlick? Bear Creek Valley Road. Right. Is that in Dixon County, Tennessee? Yes, sir, it is. Right. And uh, if you will, I want to refer you to this map that has already been marked as an exhibit. And can you point to the jury where on Bear Creek Valley Road uh, you entered the field or parked your car? Parked my car on the roadway down here so that other responding units would know where we were. Okay. So when you arrived, were there any other uh, patrol units parked on the road? Not on the road, no, sir. And you left yours on the road? Yes, sir, that is correct. And, and what did you do after that? Um, I proceeded down the tree line to where uh, Deputy Richley could park, parked his car. And if I recollect correctly, we walked together down to where Sergeant Baker's car was. Okay. And what did you observe when you found Sergeant Baker's car? The windows appeared to be covered with condensation. It, I remember being very humid that morning. Um, and I also remember um, it was parked parallel to, there's a fence line right behind that sticker. It was parked parallel to that stick, to that fence line. And it appeared that he had tried to drive through an adjacent fence line, but couldn't. And I remember uh, distinctly that the hood was, had been popped open on it. The front hood? Yes, sir. It was popped open? Yes, sir. Uh, it wasn't, it, it, it was open, but not like propped open. It, it had just been popped. Okay. Uh, 
Do you notice anything else remarkable or that you remember about uh, Unit 500 as you were walking around? Not at that time, no, sir. Okay. Uh, at this point in time, did you know where Sergeant Baker was? No, sir, I did not. So what, what did you do? May I stand up? Please. <clears throat> right here, there's a fence line, and Sergeant, Rich, Sergeant Richley and I observed a trail that, or what appeared to be a trail, on the other side of this fence line. We, we hopped the fence and started tracking that uh, trail till we lost it. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you know uh, about how long you were tracking on this trail? 20, 30 minutes. And, and what made you stop? I heard other officers back at um, Sergeant Baker's unit. Okay. And did you go back to Sergeant Baker's patrol unit? <clears throat> Yes. Need some water? <clears throat> what, what did you observe when you got back to the patrol unit? The deputies that were on scene at that time had requested permission from Captain Gafford to crack the window on the patrol unit. And um, they had popped the unit and found Sergeant Baker. And found Sergeant Baker inside the vehicle. Thank you for your testimony. I just have a few more questions. <clears throat> were, were you given additional so assignments uh, at this location on May the 30th? Yes, I was. Uh, what were you assigned to do? After it was determined that Sergeant Baker was deceased and the EMT was no longer needed at the scene, priority one, which is rush traffic, I went back to the roadway, uh, moved my vehicle approximately 50 to 75 feet inside the field and secured it with caution tape, thereby securing the scene at that location. You secured the scene of, of this location? At, at the roadway, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And did you also start a crime scene log? Yes, sir, I did. All right. I'll pass the witness. Questions? No questions. Thank you, officer. You may step down. Judge, may we approach? You may. <clears throat>
Ladies and gentlemen, when we start a trial, we never know exactly how long it's going to take for us to uh, get through witnesses or how long it's going to take for each witness to give their testimony and be cross-examined. And so, <clears throat> also, we don't know how long the lawyers are going to make in their opening statement. So, but today, uh, we don't have every witness for this case here on every single day. We have them uh, coming in on different times. So today, we are finished with all of the witnesses that we have available for today. So you're going to get an early afternoon to uh, break off. We will start. The question that I had for the jurors would be, I know you're on Eastern Standard Time. Um, does anybody have any problem with starting our court hearing at 8 o'clock in the morning instead of at 9 o'clock? <laughs> I see a thumbs up. So uh, if everybody is okay with that, any reason from the council that we couldn't do that at 8 o'clock? You're just trying to get your witnesses here, I realize, but... Judge, if that's something we can discuss more at length after court, that'd be fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, and if we can accommodate that, then we certainly will. I have no problem in trying to do this as quickly as possible, so... All right. And then under those circumstances, ladies and gentlemen, if you will uh, pass with our officer over to the jury room, then uh, we will... You can hold on to those notes, or you can leave them in the jury room as long as they have your name on them, so that you're uh, claimed by you. You shouldn't look at each other's notes, just look at your own. So, all right. Oh, and let me remind you again not to discuss this case with anyone uh, on, your, on the jury, not to let anyone discuss it with you, and don't talk about it. Talk about how nice the accommodations are, or how nice your guards are, or anything you want to talk about. But don't talk, or you can talk about UT football if you want to. I think that might be All right, there you go. You want more Oreos? Is that what you want? All right, thank you. particular juror was talking about I stole a package of Oreos out of the jury box when they had the snacks for the jury. So I asked her not to reveal that to the world and she just did. So. <laughs> All right. Well, we are ready then to uh, take up. The only other thing then for today would be uh, two things. One, I want to have a bench conference with the lawyers. But the second thing would be that I need to um, make sure that, that if there's a transcript of, of the next proceeding is what I'm understanding that you want to present to me that's been uh, redacted so that I can review that. Then what I'd like to do before council leaves today is to have a copy of that, let me review it, go over it, make sure there's no issues, and then we can uh, come back on the record and confirm that if that is in fact acceptable in the way it's been redacted. So, Mr. Wyatt has graciously created several redacted versions to provide to your honor in hopes of speeding up the process. So, Several redacted versions of the same know. transcript. We don't, we don't know exactly yet, yet how you're going to rule, so anyway, we will need to print uh, all of those versions. We can do that tomorrow morning. Uh, we'll all right, well, let's do this. Um, well, we let's start with redacted version number one and let the defense see that and see if they have any objection to it, and then I... I don't mind reading as many redacted versions as you as you have as if I need to, but I'm just thinking in terms of trying to simplify things. Let's, uh, if you have a printed version of redacted version number one, let's let the state review it and see if there's any issues about that, and then we'll talk about what needs to be redacted, and hopefully that can be done that way. So, um, in addition to that, though, I would like to have a bench conference with the lawyers if you could approach the bench. It's on the record. Today. It will be on the record. <clears throat> My microphone. All right. This is going to be a conference that I do not want reported on the news media, so if you will stop the recording for that portion of the please.
Uh, we're going to take a recess at this point in time to um, allow defense counsel and the court to uh, review the redacted transcripts that I'm being asked to consider. In addition to that, we need to have a meeting in the, in the alternate jury room back here with counsel to discuss some logistics issues. So let's go ahead and have that meeting first while Mr. Wyatt is working on the transcripts that he needs to present. So we can stand and recess. All rise. This court is in recess.
session. You may be seated. All right. Um, let me just explain that I wanted to, to uh, talk to the jurors and explain to them the reasons why um, we were not going to be able to start. Let's get this board out uh, first. Uh, Back on the record, then. Wanted to explain. We don't have a court report. Doesn't really matter. This is not anything that's necessary, in my opinion. The uh, the main thing I wanted to explain is that I've talked with the jurors and explained to them that, that logistically it's not going to be possible for us to start at eight o'clock in the morning. So we're going to leave our start time at nine o'clock. They did ask if it was possible to go later, <clears throat> and I told them I didn't think there was a problem, but. The only issue I have with that is fatigue. Uh, if the jurors start to, you know, have problems with being fatigued or whatever and losing attention, then I obviously will uh, don't want to go beyond their ability to make sure they comprehend and pay attention. So we'll play it by ear, but going beyond four or five o'clock obviously would be ideal if we can go to six and, and beyond if we need to, depending on what the circumstances are. I also know that getting ready for trial it had a text a toll on the lawyers physically, so whatever we need to do, we can do. But I, I don't think I will be stopping it right at 5 o'clock sharp tomorrow. We'll go until we have all of our witnesses. Anything else then before we adjourn? Judge, the only other issue that I foresee is that. Is this anything that we need the reporter for? No. Okay. I'm just informing the court and defense, and I've already told Mr. Evans, is Dr. Lee. Impossible for me to know whether we'll get to him on this is the uh, any okay. Uh, it's impossible for me to know right now. We'll get to him on Wednesday or Thursday. You know, that'll be the close of our proof. Uh, and I say that only because he's under subpoena in Warren County as well. And the judge in Warren County has contacted <laughs> ADA Sagan personally to try to make us pick a day. Well, I can't do that because I don't know when we'll finish. I'm just giving you the heads up if you contacted by Warren County. All right, so we will um, we'll plan on going ahead and go forward with our uh, proof at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, and we'll see how we are at that point. And the deal as far as Dr. Lee goes, we'll obviously have to deal with that. It seems to me we've got priority on it, so I think uh, no, no offense to any other judgment or any other court, but I would certainly think we need Dr. Lee when we need him, so all right. And we will stand adjourned until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. In the meantime, we'll review those transcripts, please. And sometime tomorrow, if uh, we have an attempt to go forward and, and review any objections or, or suggested changes to that transcript. Thank you. We'll stand adjourned. All rise. Recording stopped. Thank you very much.